So Hi, this is Sue. Sh Sorry. Hi, this is Sue Schmidt, the Nanslo Geo Project Coordinator. And today we are going to have a webinar on job placement, healthcare partnerships. Our speaker today is Patricia O'Hagan. Patricia is the Dean of Health Sciences, Emergency Medical Services, and Nursing for Copialani. And I probably didn't say that quite right, but sorry. Community College, University of Hawaii. Part of her work is identifying trends in healthcare careers to meet workforce needs. In doing so, she focuses on developing needed credentialed training programs and student pathways into degree and certificate healthcare programs. A goal of allied health programs is the development of statewide acute and non-acute care preceptor programs to help meet the needs of Hawaii's workforce. And as always, um, this webinar has been funded by the U.S. Department of Labor. This product, uh, as mentioned, was funded and uh, the product was created by the grantee and does not necessarily reflect the official position of the U.S. Department of Labor. The Department of Labor makes no guarantees, warranties, or assurances of any kind, express or implied with respect to such information, including any information on linked sites, and including but not limited to accuracy of the information or its completeness, completeness, <laughs> oh well, completeness, timeliness, usefulness, adequacy, continued availability, or ownership. But we do thank the U.S. Department of Labor for providing the funding for this webinar. And Patricia, at this point, I'm going to turn it over to you. Good morning, all. Um, first, I want to thank you for leaving your busy day to join us. Um, it's not that way here just yet. It's only 7 o'clock in the morning in Hawaii. Um, and the dawn is just rising. So welcome, all. Um, I don't know how many folks will have participating in the end, but what I want to do this morning is um, talk about job placement and student recruitment in the context of the processes that take place in doing so. And what I'm hoping is that by prompting you all with a series of questions and information that it um, either helps you in your work and or all of the team members whom you work with in student recruitment and job placement. So you'll see from the first slide, it says the role of the, of the community college. Now clearly that's not the only role to be responsive to needs, it's to provide open access to students. And it's often the first stop in a long career of education, at least that's what we hope for. But in terms of student recruitment and job placement, Perception and response are two very critical issues. And so perception, I've got it there as a question mark. Are you proactive or reactive? And when I say are you, what I'm really asking is you, the institution, your team, and your partner, the educator, too, and the industry. Is the industry proactive or reactive? Are they looking at the long-term goals or only the short-term? Is your institution, your team, and yourself proactive or reactive? And those, you'll see that theme throughout my presentation because one of the critical comments that we always get is that we, A, we're not flexible enough to be proactive and uh, so we only take the long term and that there are a number of stumbling blocks within community colleges that prevent being proactive. I'll talk a little bit about that. But in addition to it, when we talk about student placement, we often focus on the workplace and we need to keep two points in, in uh, front and center. One is both the student needs and the workforce needs. And it's the student in the educational institution and it's the student in the workforce that we really need to keep front and center. Because if we know only the industry needs and the institutional needs, the educational institution needs, and we drop the student out of it, we're going to have a significant mismatch. So it's all of those balls in the air together. But if it's kind of like if you think of patient care, it's student-centered care, both in the education place and the workforce. Has anyone got any questions about that so far? Or are you feeling fine about that? Oh. 
Okay. What I would ask you to do in your own mind, or if you have paper in front of you, you probably know those people, both industry and in your education, who, you, who are your top proactive responders. I want you to make a list of those. And I want you to think of, and this is a little bit harder and a little bit more difficult to do, who are the reactors? You probably know them. The reactors tend to be the complainers in industry, and they be, tend to be the team members in your campus who you're not sure are actually on side. So if you can dichotomize those two lists, you'll start seeing where perhaps some of your issues are in student job placement and student retention. So I'm going to move on to the next slide. So the next slide we're really looking at is a key to student recruitment and job placement. In addition to knowing the needs of who is a proactive person and who is reactive in this process, we also need to know how you know that. How are they evaluated? Are they evaluated? Is that evaluation accurate? Whose, whose position are you taking when you do an evaluation of your team? And to that end, who are your partners? Are your partners evaluated, or do you just assume that those partners, when they identify the skills and attitudes needed for the job, that they're accurate? How are they evaluated from your institutional point of view? How are they evaluated by your students? How are they evaluated from the outcomes of the program and in new hiring? So how, how do you evaluate yourself and your partners? Who is responsible for partnering and finding out what the skills and attitudes are and aptitudes for the job? Because if it's a one-way street, it's not going to work. And I'm going to give some examples of where it does work and where it doesn't work. So does your institution have different skills and attitudes in a program than what your workforce has? And what happens is, very often, you can articulate those skills and aptitudes for a specific job, but the workforce has a much broader definition for that. And I'm sure you're all aware of workforce readiness. But we rarely get a definition or a clear articulation of what those are. So what are all the different definitions of the skills and aptitudes needed for a job? And does your institution know them? Do you know them? Does your team know them? And does your partner? And do you have regular meetings or surveys to make sure that you're all aligned? Normally, what I've found is that we articulate very well the programs. But in the end, when the students go for their job placement and recruitment, there's a number of skills that are identified that the programs aren't meeting. That's a serious misstep often in our relationship. But there is light at the end of the tunnel because you can either build them into the program and or build them into continuing education if there's something that is missing for job readiness. And it really does take the team approach to identify those. No one has all of that information. But how do you get that information from your team? And so I ask you to, when I've got these questions up, are you able to articulate that? Or is that something that comes to you easily? Do you know what that looks like? Have you got those answers at your hands? The next slide is the plan and the process. So as I mentioned earlier, it's not just immediate needs, but we have to build a workforce for the long view. And Mostly, when we work with uh, employers and students, we're looking at immediate needs. They finished a class, they want to get a job, and there's a vacancy. And while that needs to happen, it's a mistake in planning and process if we're not doing the long view. So the creativity part of planning and process is seeing your student and student placements as a long-term relationship rather than they're graduated and they're gone. And in fact, that planning and view helps with grants because most grants now that 
um, are looking at job placement require you to follow students beyond graduation. So changing our mindset about who the student is, that they are still in relationship with you after graduation, flips a switch that they're no longer an in and out participant in this job placement process. It also helps in career pathways, which we'll be speaking to. So how do you line these long-term and short-term needs? The who, the when, the where, the why, and the how are very important. How is that often is that done to do this alignment? When is it done? At the beginning or at end of a term? Is it done annually or quarterly? Where is it done? Is it done on the workers' turf or is it done in the academic setting? And let me tell you, it makes a difference. Um, that conversation about alignment with lifelong learning gets a very different feel for it if you're doing it, if, say, in the HR office of a hospital versus coming to uh, an academic setting. The rationale that I can only explain for that is because people are more comfortable sometimes in their own setting and feel more likely to share information. And so that where may seem innocuous, but it's not. The why. Why do we do that? As I said, because it's not just a partner of the workforce who's going to come in and out of your life because they will or will not have job openings, but the students too. They become your lifelong partners. And then the how, You'll see I put the how is career pathways as a development tool, but it's not just career pathways identified simply because of the career pathway for the student. It's a career pathway that has built on and off ramps. So you want to look at your pathways as complex processes, not just as the student and the employee. And the next slide is about human capital, your students. And Harvard Business Review in 2014 did a survey and showed that the most important factor for building a healthy economy is an educated, skilled labor force. And you can see that not only in the labor force, but you can see that in society in general. You raise the, the level of your population health, lifelong uh, living, by having an educated and skilled workforce. So that's important how we see our students and how we see our workforce and what those relationships are. The career pathway ladder um, really is a sequence of credentialing. So you can begin at this continuing education level, but you can also move on to certificates, degrees, and exit points that come off and on throughout the career ladder. And your employer needs to know those, not just your academic institution. It's very, very important that you are building those degree pathways with your partner, not just from the needs of the community college or the university for which the students are going to be taking their programs. So the the ingredients for success for your team is the key for student placement and student recruitment. And I'll shortly be getting to some examples that we've used that have been usual, unusual and different. Um, the first one is who are your team members? And you may have multiple teams, not one. Um, do you know, and if you look down this list on this slide, the last one is memorandums of agreement that outline the skills to be practiced in the with your industry partner site. Do you know those MOAs? Because you can creatively use memorandums of agreement to integrate and leverage different programs. You don't have to have one for one program. What we've done at Kapilani Community College is done master MOA agreements and that has helped in placing students into jobs that we that pop up and out of the system that if you don't have an memorandum of understanding already in place, you're continually doing them. So we try to do them out for five years and cover all programs. 
And that way, when you're developing new programs, if the concept is broad enough, you can incorporate them in there without having to create new ones. The teams that you have for ingredient success are quite broad. And I know that we think of managers and clinicians as our main uh, team members when we're doing job placements. But what I think is very useful are preceptors and mentors on both sides of the equations, whether they be on the campus or in the workforce. So counselors, we have faculty counselors themselves who know our students in the health uh, sector very, very well. And they know the clinical coordinators very, very well. They know the uh, positions that are becoming available. But they're focused on a very narrow area, which is their programs and their um, courses. Preceptors and mentors within the industry are privy to things that are being developed within the workforce that we may not know about. Not just HR and not just managers, but the, the uh, frontline folks actually have a sense of who and what is happening in the workforce. They see trends long before our early warning systems often do. And that helps us know what we might be developing both short and long term. So those who makes up your team is very important. And the second point about direct contact is extremely important too. These can't be, although you want to have surveys done and you want to be able to pick up the phone and speak to each other on your team. Until you develop that team and they become second nature to the process, you do need to have direct contact with them. Um, they need to know who you are. They need to be able to build trust and respect within the workplace. And that's very important with student placement. I could give you an example of where uh, an HR manager just recently called me and, and was speaking to me about a particular student in a particular program. And he said to me at the end of the phone call, you know, it's because we have the kind of a relationship we do that I feel comfortable of picking up the call and calling you. So it's very important that those relationships are built at many different levels. The ability to be able to go broad and survey them, the ability to be able to have a direct relationship, and in some cases daily, depending on what you're doing. The next piece of that ingredient is uh, program and field advisory boards. It's very interesting to me that um, advisory boards for different programs tend to be the educators and the clinicians, and often not the people who know about the long-term jobs that are coming on board. They're focused on one piece of information again. What is a creative way for job placement and for supporting students is to put donors on your advisory boards. Donors are interested in student placement. They want their money to be used for student success. So putting donors on your advisory boards is very important. So there's another team member that we don't normally think of when we think of partnerships in job placement. But your foundation people at your different campuses should be aware of and have donors on your advisory boards. The other people that should be on your advisory boards are the students themselves. Someone who you successfully placed should be a member of your advisory board. They can tell you what is happening in the workplace. They're more likely to have a fresh eye at what's happening in your workplace. And they can also tell you the gaps in their own recent education. So students are a very valuable member of advisory boards, and we don't often have them included. And, and, many, and many advisory boards are alumni members, so you, they serve a dual purpose, not just for student placement and student recruitment. The next one are accreditation um, members or agencies and industry standards. Those people who are responsible for accreditation or industry standards are often not on advisory boards either, but can be or they can be standalone. Some accreditation bodies like it when members of the accreditation team are aware of, because they do them at site visit, the advisory boards. But some of them actually want to be on the advisory boards. So I ask you to think about that. Think about who in your accreditation team on the multiple programs that you might have would, would be the go-to person to um, both answer questions about 
what is needed in the industry, what makes students success, but that your programs are meeting those industry standards and accreditation. And it behooves um, student placement counselors and directors to know those accreditation standards because a key, of course, again, to student success are the skills and standards of which their program is directed. Um, another, and I will keep saying this, another key to success are career pathways. So your team members also need to understand your career pathways, not just those who are um, within the academic setting. Everyone should know what the career pathways are from high school right through to um, master's and PhD. Because if you have all of those people on uh, your advisory board meetings, you are able to more quickly change and creatively learn about student recruitment issues that might come up and the needs that might change from generation to generation. So taking the career pathway into student recruitment is a key to developing sound and really useful skill development for your students and for your team. And the last one, as I mentioned, is the MOA. And I started out with that one, um, speaking to it about knowing and having broad MOAs. But it's a continual process of engagement on all of these fronts that allows for success ingredients in student placement and student recruitment and having a team approach. Um, the next slide um, is about the Department of Labor. And why I put this up is because I came to the University of Hawaii Kapolei Community College in the fall of 2010 and had the privilege of serving on a skills panel. And one of my questions to you all is, do you have skills panels? Do they meet and how often? Do you have follow-up um, with surveys on them if you do have skills panel? Why it was important for us is it developed a state plan and identified the three most important um, outcomes that we wanted to meet. And we were able to provide a skills panel by grants as well as partnering with the Department of Labor on funding where we brought people from all sectors of the healthcare industry to um, come together to identify gaps in student recruitment and student placement, and also develop an early warning system. So this uh, was the beginning, and we've had a series of them subsequently. And now we are able to tighten a very, very broad, comprehensive group to a much smaller group where people come and go depending on the needs of what we're trying to build. So I'm wondering what each state has and what each team has within colleges and universities and how they're managing, because that was the driving force for planning the student model for uh, placement. And the next slide is. Can you? I'm sorry. Can you explain exactly? This is Lavona. Can you, I'm, I'm the really okay. loud one of our group, can you explain more about the skills panel and how that works? Because that really sounds okay. interesting, but um, it's not something Perfect. that we do here. Okay, Lavona, so what we did was um, in 2010, we went to the governor's office and we asked how we could bring everyone together in all of the different industries, and so we we were able to obtain funding. The Department of Labor was given money. And we, we developed a state workforce plan. And what we, we did it over three days. And we brought, we had guest speakers come in about the problems with skill development, the problems with job placement, the problems with workforce readiness, and also the successes. And we did a series of roundtables where we put people in their typical silos, meaning we put them into the nursing table, we had the respiratory table, we had all the different programs. And then, and at those tables, they designed survey questions about 
what they believed were the issues for student placement and workforce readiness. And then we mixed them up. So we put all the programs, we integrated, whether it be a human resource person, a clinician, an educator, um, an academic, a student from the area. We mixed all the tables up from across the areas and we said, okay, it should ought not matter where you're from to be able to have a successful student placement. What it should matter is that we're meeting the goals regardless of the program. Our intention initially was to find the early warnings for particular programs, but the outcome was with an integration of all of the programs, not only the early warning and not only how many jobs and, and what we were going to talk about for, you know, what might be needed on one island versus another, but this plan of long-term needs. And what we've been able to do then, out of those, we created a whole um, manual that shows the outcomes of that, the industry needs, the long and short term goals. And I, I've, I've got a copy I could send out. I, I believe it's available online as well. And subsequent to that then, we met with smaller groups and now we do it by survey rather than face to face meetings because it was a very costly adventure. I mean it was a ballroom full of people, right? It was hundreds of people. Now what we do is I build into grants what I call policy planning working groups and those policy planning work groups come together for specific needs now usually once a semester so that for instance if it becomes an issue of let's say in nursing a HIPAA issue that might pop up at a hospital what are we going to do immediately to the curriculum and for the students and for the faculty to do training around something that might have been a violation of HIPAA for instance so that we have continuous community input, not just through the programs, but at a state level. Does that help, Lavana? That was very okay. good. It, Thank it, you. It's a really good process because now we have statewide buy-in into this, and we can call on people for a number of different issues. The last thing that came out of that, and it's going to happen this April, is now one of the hardest things, at least for us at at our college is fundraising for the health programs. People all want the health programs, but it's very difficult. We've got lots of scholarships for them. But it's fundraising for the programs itself as, as enrollment's declining. We now are doing international guest speakers, and all of these folks that are on the state planning boards, we can invite them to our fundraising events. So there's leveraging of all of these people that we now have included. And some of them are, you know, not just human resource managers, clinicians, but some of the people, because it's the state level, at state level, are those who, in fact, are donors to major programs. So you're building it into a plan, a long-term plan. It's been very successful for us. So I'm, I, I think it's a useful tool and, and process for identifying the issues in your uh, student recruitment and placement. Okay. Thank you for the question. Bona. So this was the outcome of that um, panel. Now, when I say this was the outcome, there were several, several recommendations, but these were the top three, and they were meshed down to um, what we could do within a planning period. So we now plan based on those issues each year looking at different ways of being successful. So the first one was, of course, in the next eight, 12 to 18 months. What can we do immediately? Where are the needs? What are the jobs? Where's the funding? What training needs to happen immediately? And then what's the plan of action for the long term? And that's the program, the policy planning working groups that I mentioned. That was the plan for the long term. The short term was bringing together both the continuing education, the service learning area, and the faculties who are assigned, the faculty members who are assigned to particular uh, course outcomes, bringing them together as a team and seeing what we could do in 12 to 18 months. Then bringing together our grant writers and looking at funding to do that that were short-term turnarounds, so small grants, $5,000, developed curriculum. And then being responsive, what modules could we put in place immediately? to answer those questions. 
so those were the fun things that you can put in quickly, but you have to be very flexible and your system has to be able to react to it. Number two, the long-term labor needs is where you really have to do the work of building your teams, knowing what you want to do. And that's why I put it at the front of the presentation, because I know you realize all the team members you need, but how you use them over long-term plans is a really important issue. And so that if you only call upon them every once in a while and they don't stay connected to you, you're less likely to get long-term need planning done. And so there has to be another level to that. And at, when you do it at the state level, you get greater commitment. So for instance, right now, I still have an ongoing relationship with a person at our governor's office who is continually writing grants. And I'm always calling her and say, OK, well, what's your next grant about? And how can we leverage that into student recruitment and placement and labor needs? So that you know, you're always building that, always. And then the communication gap is going to be a continual issue, as I'm sure you know, because people come and go. Different people are in different jobs. They move around. And it behooves you to have someone or more than some person on your team who is identifying where people are moving all the time so that you're not continually trying to scramble to find out who your main contact is for a particular issue on your team. And more importantly, so that there's two-way street, that it's not looking like everything's coming from industry to the college or that the competencies are all being told from the college to industry that is really seen as a bridge, a, a, an on and off ramp between two partners, two, two partners. And I'll, I, as I said, I'll give you an example of, of one that worked really, really well for us. The next one is, what is your model for curriculum development? And um, we developed something called the Program Leadership Council. So all faculty members who are responsible for development of curriculum, which should match accreditation standards, which should match and align industry standards, which should be brought into uh, workforce readiness, should be part of a monthly meeting that looks at the, school, uh, the skills and knowledge and attitudes needed for lifelong learning. Interestingly enough, however, the skills and the knowledge tend to be what the faculty look at. They are the ones who are looking at the competencies and the program learning outcomes. Attitudes is a more difficult one, and yet the one that seems to be the stumbling block oftentimes in workplace and student recruitment. And what we did was we integrated faculty members who are counselors into our health programs, and they know our students. They are the, the linchpin between the faculty and um, the student attitudes. Now, the faculty know them too, but they're focused more on skills and knowledge. And yes, they'll weed out those students who may, ought not to be maybe in a particular area of healthcare, but those are usually those ones that are the most obvious. The ones where students are having issues with bus fare, somebody who might become pregnant and wants to continue their education, someone whose family member may have died, someone who might know that there might be an issue in the workplace or in a student recruitment. It's bringing in the counselors that it has been key to us. So it, the issue is being aware of those issues of attitudes. And the other question is, have we even asked? Have we ever asked a student, do you feel comfortable going into this recruitment? So that role playing and career, career readiness is very important. But how do you know that they are ready? How do you know that even if they do well on an aptitude test and skill and uh, career readiness, how do you really know that? So one of the things that you can put into place for attitudes is when they're doing clinical placements, and I'm sure you already do this, is that you're surveying both the institution where they're being, uh, where they're receiving their skill training, and the students. And one of the things that we found was in some programs, the faculty members weren't going out on a regular basis. Some programs were doing it really well and some programs weren't. And that's where the slippage happens because they can go and do their clinical placements and do them either successfully or not, but it's the more subtle issues of attitudes that have been problematic and that we really need to attend to and do take a lot of time. And it's the one that all human resource managers talk about. 
the skills and knowledge we've worked we've been able to work through and 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 I'll show you that but the attitude issues are the ones that need our attention and they're a key to job placement and job success they're also a key to bring students back into our career ladders so let me talk about the career ladders so in that model of skill knowledge and attitudes it's not just workforce readiness but it's career readiness does your do your students have this notion of lifelong learning what does that mean and we're trying to start working at the high school level to have that put in place do you have program courses and training not just long term but modules can can students take modules that are stackable are our career readiness and workforce readiness built into programs or are they separate does that matter or not? Pre and post graduation career pathways. Does your workforce team and your students know about pre and post graduation courses for career pathways? Because that's where you can build programs that not only build the income for the college, but build, build skills for graduation. I'm going to give you an example. We have a uh, surge tech program in our nursing program the surge tech program was really hot for a while we had to retrain a number of employees in the hospitals to become surge techs but now what we see is that's dwindling the numbers needed and we're really what the hospitals want is operating room nurses so then we can design a short-term course for operating room nurse and alternate surge tech one year with operating room nurse the next year so you have to think about pre and post graduation search tech become operating room nurse those are career pathways you want to look at the different ways of integrating job placement and recruitment it's not simply the immediacy continuing education or continuing me medical education is a golden opportunity both for income but also for student recruitment it might be those little wee things like attitudes that you might want to build a continuing education program for particularly if it's um, something that's very difficult in a hospital um, now we have almost a two-month orientation for our faculty and students before they even go into clinical and I, they all, they're almost literally employees of the hospitals so what can we do to help that process customize contracts those are the short term contracts for specific training such as uh, paramedic training that might include um, we do it as a credit course but might include community paramedic training so they're customized contracts but those customized contracts often if done well re turn into repeat contracts and they trust you you've built credibility so the next time they think about okay we need to be able to get a group of students trained quickly in this particular area we can do it with this college service learning of course is built into most programs as is the field experience and uh, some people don't make the distinction between service learning and field experience but I see it as a distinction because in one area it's volunteer and the other area it may or it may not be voluntary so job placement who and where are you so this is your job are you a generalist or a specialist how do you know how often does that change what are do you expect to be a generalist or a specialist does your institution and does the workforce your partners who do they see you as industry credentials newly identified occupations so in your role whether you're a generalist or a specialist let me give you an example of occupational therapy. There is an occupation that people have a particular code to be placed as an occupational therapist, and yet the workplace now is hiring occupational therapists all over the place. And so, are you working with your industry to identify the development of new credentials? That's a long term goal, but it's an important one because the workforce is changing very dramatically and if you have a program that is identified only by their currently federally identified occupational code you're missing all the job placement places that students can go for that 
job with those skills, and you're not counting them towards those occupations. So new credentials is very, very important, and that takes a lot of work, takes a lot of effort, but that is something that you need to be focusing on. Where are your current jobs, whether they're well-defined long-term jobs, where are they branching out to? And in healthcare, because we're working more and more with communities, the acute care occupations are very often now looking at community, and it might require a different credential because of reimbursement for that job. It may not any longer be only the skill in the acute care. It might be long-term care. It might be ambulatory care. It might be wellness and prevention. So look at that because they are not going to the meeting your students or your graduates. They're not going to go take a job in the community until they know that their credentials are going to be reimbursable and or recognized by industry. So that's, that's our work. That's not your students' work. That's our work. Salaries that match sustainable living wage. I do a lot of presentations on entry-level health care positions that do not have a living wage. It does us a disservice to place students and recruit students into a job that's entry level without a career pathway that gives them a living wage. And that's another emphasis why I focus on career pathway. It's fine to get them into an entry level job at $11, $13 an hour. But that is not sustainable and it's not something that we should think is okay and that we put out there as a goal of an off-ramp into a college. There has to be a return of those students to come back for further education so that they have a living wage. And that's our responsibility as well. Standardized preceptor training programs across your programs. I'm sure if you look at your health programs, you have a number of different models of preceptor training. And there are a number of models where the preceptors are free. There's models where the preceptors are, are paid. There's models where they're trained within the health industry they work in. There's models where they're trained within the academic institution, within the program of which they're training the students. I see this one as a very important issue. You can bring preceptors together across programs on your institution that address those attitudes and skills and training. So your preceptors don't have to be just about the skills your students are doing. You can integrate them into your campus training and into your program. And it's a valuable exercise. Because then, preceptors in hospitals are talking to each other. They get to know each other. The students see them when they're on campus. The faculty members get to see them. And it integrates your programs in a much better way. They also, my question to you is, are you a participant on your advisory boards? Do you attend your advisory board meetings? That's a very interesting place for you to put yourself because you get to know your team better if you're actually on your advisory boards. When you do an agreement with um, your workforce industry partners, are they providing resources to your programs for a one to three year equipment, commitment? If you are providing the uh, curriculum, if you're providing them with students, what are they giving in return? Not just sitting at advisory boards, but are they providing resources to your pro support your programs? And that's an important piece for you, and that's where you can find um, support through your advisory boards, is asking for support for your programs. Um, certificates, degrees for work and career pathways. You should be able to design new ones. Of course, you have to show an assessment and the needs. But you as a job placement coordinator need to be part of that work because you know, won't, won't know what's coming if you're not part of it. And the same with continued professional development. If you're not part of those industries, you're not going to know where the gaps are and where the jobs are. So it looks like a whole lot of meetings and, and bodies that you'd be on. But somehow you have to get that information to do your job well. It can't be just running out and looking for job placements and recruitments. So here's our programs at Kapilani Community College, and there's another one that I can add, several of them. But I put them into these um, categories for a number of reasons, and of course, they're not discrete, and they ought not to be seen as discrete. But the physical health ones, occupational therapy, physical therapy, exercise and sport and massage, are over there for a reason, and those are the ambulatory care prevention group. 
that can work as a team. And I'm just trying to put our teams together when I do that. The lab group, the dental radiology, um, medical lab technicians, the lobotomy, those groups can work together and ought to be working together and not in silos. Office, the medical assisting and the health informatics. And we've added a new one that I'll show you in a moment called school health aid. But those who are focused on records and in offices. And the last are the acute care, so respiratory, nursing, and paramedics. Now, all of them do each of those things. There's no doubt about that. But their primary focus tends to be on that. Now, those are agreements that we make with our workforce, as you see as the title of the slide, and they are strategically aligned. But I could put my finger on any one of them, for instance, nursing, and tell you that the AS degree in nursing is now going to become focused on acute care, or pardon me, on um, long-term care, because about there's a 60-40 split of RNs and BSNs, and the the RNs, who are the AS degree nurses, are tending now to be hired in long-term care. So they're starting to look more at physical health. So they cross over into the physical health. So at no time is this discreet, but you have to see them and put them in their own silos. But in, in fact, they should be working with each other, both within their groups and across their groups. And you, as the job placement counselor, need to be able to lay this out and show them that. Show them how students are recruited into these areas and some places don't have any different qualifications other than their skills to be in one area, to be in the physical health area, to be in the lab area, to be in the office, to be in acute. Recruitment has the same issues for those students. So you can bring them all together. You don't have to do them in silos. So here's an example. Across the street from, literally across the street from Kapilani Community College is a long-term care hospital called Malahia Hospital. Uh, pardon me, Leahi. Malahia is uh, several miles away. But they're both long-term care hospitals. And what we are doing there is we're building gerontology skill labs and patient experiences for all of the health programs. So think of places where you can build teaching hospitals even though you're a community of college. It doesn't have to be the doctor. It could be you can integrate your health care programs. And why that's important is when you build into long-term care, which is the growing population of needs for jobs, when you build them into um, your student experience, they're more likely to get jobs in those institutions. So finding places where you know population health issues are, partnering with them to create programs that are embedded into the institution to give clinical practice is almost a surefire way. As you know, for nurses, we've been doing it for decades. But the shift is to long-term care. So look for places where you know those issues are coming. You can also leverage those, for instance, if you have culinary programs, dietary programs, programs where you can cross integrate both, for instance, the health with a, a culinary program. That's one example. Next one is, this one is a very current one. This was a relationship between the KCC, Copulated Community College, the Department of Education, the Department of Health. And out of it came two memorandums of agreement. So across the state there are 255 incumbent workers for the Department of Education or called School Health Aid. And all they needed was a high school diploma and eight hours of training that was provided by Department of Health nurses. And off they went. They became our glorified babysitters in high schools and elementary. They worked six-hour days. They're taking care of hundreds and hundreds and thousands of our students in, in our elementary and high schools. One school health aide that I talked to dealt with 57 students a day. So the Department of Health nurses had a manual that they did this eight-hour training with. We wrote a grant that was funded. And the first grant allowed us to take that curriculum of eight hours and develop a CTE certificate that, was a, that is now being developed into a required entry level into the job, not just this eight-hour training. We've finished two cohorts. 
and we pulled out the bugs of that program. It was federally funded, so that program is actually going to be up on a federal site that every campus in the United States will have access to the curriculum. That's the beauty of writing grants. Everybody wins. And all of this work that's done in the background, then you just build your teams to bring this to fruition. Underground four, we're building skill level two. We're hoping to get a salary increase, so there's another team partner you have to build in your union representatives. We've made an agreement with the Department of Education that skill level one is not a requirement for the current employees, meaning those who are currently employed only into new employees, but I can tell you that of the 255, 170 are on the island of Oahu, and 100 signed up within the first month. Even those who have been working in it for decades, because they wanted a CTE certificate, they wanted to become a college student. Some of them had never been a college student in their lives. So it was a very successful program. Skill level two, it requires that they have completed skill level one to take skill level two. And skill level two will be a pathway into two of our programs that will have a further pathway to a BAs. In the medical assisting program, it will go on to the um, University of Hawaii West Oahu office administration. So for those folks who like office, front office work. And the other area will be community health worker, those who want to work with the actual clients. And that will be pathwayed with a public health degree at the University of Hawaii, Manoa. So there's a really current example of working with multiple stakeholders, bringing them onto campus, developing MOAs. It included all of the folks that I told you about in the teams. But importantly, we brought them to campus so that we didn't ostracize anybody in the process. And the buy-in was significant. It has been one of the most successful grants I think I've ever worked on in my career because of how well we brought all the partnerships together. So that's one example. Another example is the nursing career pathway. So students can enter into the nurse aid and pathway into the licensed practical nurse way and pathway into the ADN. And then they can pathway into the four-year campus at Manoa. They can also become long-term residential care operators. And they can also go on to search tech. So the nursing program has really a nice package, but it also can branch out into other areas. But I wanted to show you that career pathway that they, once the student is in the program, the counselors know them. The encouragement is to keep going, not to come in and out of your path. But if they do leave and get experience, we are in constant contact with them to come back to the program. And this very complicated chart shows that. So it shows the pathways and the exams and where they're positioned into the workforce. It shows you two standalones, the search tech, but because I haven't now, I haven't connected it to the operating room nurse. But that is not a standalone anymore. And I wanted to show you that because not only do you have your team, but you have the pathway. You can give this presentation to your community partners and also your, to your students so they see it, so they understand it. And I've even gone so far as to connect the salaries to it so the students get a, a picture of, well, if I come in as a nurse aide and I make $13, look at what I'm going to make when I'm an RN. Look what, what I'll make if I get a master's. So it presents them with encouragement, not just monetary, but scope of practice. So what is the difference between a nursing assistant and a long-term um, nursing assistant, long-term care okay, nursing so assistant? The, the nursing assistants are focused on long-term care. However, um, what we've done is we create a module that specifically looks at also working in the community, not just in an acute care facility or, or a long-term care facility. So they get an additional community perspective of partnering with families and the community, as well as those who might be coming and looking, for instance, at uh, an ARPN who might be looking at drugs. So it's an extra component. OK, so, so you can go straight from being a long-term nursing assistant into adult care 
um, home operator. You can go to the or program. the program. So you don't have to have your own to do that. You can yes. do that just from. Yes. Because the okay. operator. And, uh, that's okay. okay. I'm sorry. The operator, the home operator position. Right now, you've seen a, a number of. I mean, they're they're popping up all over the place. The the home health cares and the residential homes that are taking in up to four and five clients. And so you want to make sure that you have a minimum of entry level requirements. So not just an entrepreneur, but they have some training. And you're seeing it in most residential cares, they're hiring long term care nurses into the program, into their houses. So we wanted to make sure that they have that joint training. And that's what we've been focusing on, not just the entrepreneur spirit of it. Okay, great. Thank you. Any other questions? We've got about three minutes left. Um, I think what what's helpful for you as um, placement officers is that you really are the linchpin, you are the bridge, but if you take it all on yourself, which I know that you have teams, if you take it all on yourself, not only are you going to burn out, but in the end, um, you really need a team who can address all of these issues and speak with you, not to you and not at you, but with you. And the more integration you can of all of your programs, the better your recruitment and placement are, the faster you'll find the issues. And I think we're just about out time. If anyone has any comments or questions. Uh, Patricia, just one thing. Um, will you please share the link to that document on skills I will, that you mentioned? Absolutely. I will. And then what what I will do is we have a section for career professional development where I post the uh, recording of this session as well as material that is provided. So I'll put that link there, but I'll also communicate that out to everyone so you know where that link is. Lovely. And the second thing that I do um, want to mention is we always uh, try to ask for feedback on these uh, webinars. And so I am posting right now a link to the feedback on this particular webinar just uh, as we're rolling this down to make sure that everybody who's participated today provides their feedback as well. I have also been monitoring the chat window and suggested any other questions. And thank you so much, Lavona, for asking questions. That's awesome. It's really helpful because then we know that we are addressing your questions as well. But I want to also open it up to others. Um, and if you do have any last minute questions before we close this session, please use the chat area because I don't think you are on the phone or you can pop in on your microphone as well. So we'll just give it a second to see if anyone has any questions. I really appreciate people. Yeah, I really appreciate people Thank taking time out of their day, and 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 listening Absolutely. to this. And and I'm I'm happy to answer questions offline as well. Awesome, that's great. And what I'm doing right now is just kind of looking at the participants because I know if somebody is um, actually typing in because you see this little comment thing, and so I don't see anyone actually um, inputting any questions for you. Okay. So with that, um, again, I want to thank you, Patricia, very much for taking the time to get day and uh, doing this webinar for us. And I know for everyone, you know, it's a three-hour difference. So Patricia was kind enough to come in at 7 a.m. this morning to do this webinar for us. Um, so I really appreciate all the time and effort, Patricia, that you have provided today. And I think it's been some very um, amazing information as these career, career coaches uh, try to think of ways that they can uh, promote job placement in industry partnerships as well. So with that, um, again, everyone who has participated today, we would really appreciate your feedback. 
Um, and uh, I want to thank all of you as well for taking time out of your busy days to participate in this webinar. And I want to say alo gonna... aloha and mahalo. <laughs> Absolutely. You know, it's a lot warmer there than it is here, trust us. <laughs> Trust me, and most of us are in cold places. So, <laughs> okay. Thank you so much, Patricia, for Thanks. joining us today. Thanks, Sue. Bye bye. Uh huh. Bye bye. And Patricia and Kevin, to exit the session, you would just click on the X in the right-hand corner of the software.